Hello, my beautiful and intellectually curious and definitely very skeptical love bugs. Welcome to today's video where we are going to be going over six insect myths that you probably believe uh, but shouldn't. And if you love bugs like this video, we can do a part two because God knows there's enough insect myths to like fill a whole book. The first one on our list is the crane fly also sometimes called skeeter eaters, also sometimes called mosquito hawks, eat mosquitoes. There's a lot to unpack here. The first thing is, if you ever see a crane fly or you've never actually heard of one before, crane flies look like giant mosquitoes. However, they are a different insect. They are in their own group. They are in the family Tapulidae, whereas the mosquitoes are in the family Culicidae. And if you're like, you just threw out two words, it's basically saying like dogs and gorillas are the same animal. They are not. So people say that the crane flies eat mosquitoes. However, if you actually look at the mouth parts of the crane fly, which I, I know you definitely do all the time, you will see how kind of ridiculous that statement is because they do not have a kind of mouth part that can do any kind of biting, piercing, sucking, chewing, etc. So a quick rundown on insect mouth parts because you're here and you know you asked. If the crane fly was going to attack and grab mosquitoes out of the air, we would expect it to have mouth parts similar to that of another fly family called the robber flies or the acylids, which do do exactly that. They kind of just fly around like helicopters and grab insects out of the air and like stab their kind of like piercing like mouth part into it and then drink it dry. So crane flies do not have that mouth part. You also have like blood feeding mouth parts and some of these blood feeders will even feed on other insects, which is really crazy. So if we look at mosquito mouth parts, they have a proboscis. That's the thing that when they land on you, they stick it in you and you don't feel it because there's, you know, good spit in there that makes you, that kind of numbs the area so you don't feel it and then they'll just suck your blood. Those are the fun ones because you just itch a little bit later, you don't actually notice when it's biting you. The other kind is what we call pool feeders, and the pool feeders literally like fly over, they have a huge saw blade for their mouth part, land on you, cut your skin open till it bleeds, and then sit there and like lap it up. This is like horse flies, and this is why it hurts so much. If we look at the humble crane fly and its mouth parts, you'll see it doesn't look like any of those. It's not pointy, it can't like stab things through, so it can't suck any liquids out of them, and it's also not like a saw blade, so it's not cutting anything open and opening them up. What they do have is a sponge-like tongue mouth part, which is very common for flies. This is what most flies have, and so they are just lapping up rotting liquidy gunk. It's a simple life, but an important one because they're helping us with our decomposition. Crane flies do not eat mosquitoes. By the way, welcome back to my channel, Love Bugs. For those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study bugs and also wear them in like, you know, some people wear their passions on their sleeve. I like literally made at my arm a sleeve of the things that I like. <laughs> so, I live in Ecuador where normally I'm doing ecotourism telling you about all the cool bugs that live here as I tote you around the jungle, but obviously the 2020 and 2021 vibes, that is not happening, so hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. If you are enjoying this video, I expect you to punch that like button, like super hard, and also subscribe, it helps the channel out, and helps us all learn about and love insects just a little bit more. Without further ado, let's get into the rest of these. The second one that you may have heard of is that daddy long legs are the most venomous spider. However, their fangs are just too small to be able to pierce through that tough, tough skin of yours. That tough, tough skin of yours apparently protects against daddy long legs and also mean internet comments. There's a couple things going on with this myth. First of all, there's three different arthropods that can be considered daddy long legs. The crane flies were first on this list because one of the types of daddy long legs are actually crane flies. They are not spiders, and as we just established, can't bite you. So they are out, cross, <coughs> off, 
off the list, goodbye. Kicked to the curb. That leaves the other two. There is a spider, which is commonly referred to as the cellar spiders, but are sometimes by some people referred to as daddy long legs as well. These are true spiders. They do have venom glands. However, they like just don't bite people. Like they're not aggressive. There's nothing in the medical literature to suggest that they are in any way harmful to humans. Even the venom that they have is not potent to people. If you think about it from like a spider's perspective, you don't really need to have venom that is attacking people or large mammals unless you're trying to protect yourself because you want to be shutting down insect internal systems and not human internal systems and we are quite different. We're, we're a, a lot similar. We're a lot more similar than you might expect. But we're different enough that you need different chemicals. When we look at spiders that are dangerous to humans, they have specific proteins to affect mammals and specific proteins to affect insects. They have both and many of them because sometimes something just wins at the evolution game. The third arthropod that people consider to be daddy long legs are what probably you are thinking of most commonly daddy long legs and these are the harvest men or in their own order opilionis. Opilionis are not spiders. Spiders are like their own thing. They're their own order and opilionis, harvest men or daddy long legs are their own things. Daddy long legs or harvest men or opilionis that we're calling them now because you are a big brained love bug so now you can use the fancy name opilionis for the whole order. They don't even have venom glands. It's crazy, right? <laughs> so they have no venom glands. They catch their prey. Some of them are predaceous, but many are scavengers. They have these things in the front. In fact, all arachnids have these things in the front called pedipalps. They're all used for different things. Scorpions, the pedipalps, are the claws. And spiders, the pedipalps, are enlarged, especially in the males, to help uh, do the sexy times. And in Opilionis, their pedipalps are like modified in many of them a little bit to be kind of like little claw-like grabbery things that help them do exactly that. This is a science channel. <laughs> so first of all, they don't have the modified chelicerae. Spiders have modified chelicerae, which are the fangs in the front, which are hollowed out to deliver the venom. Opilionis don't have those. They have the structure of the chelicerae, but they are not hollowed out and cannot deliver venom. And they mainly cannot deliver venom because they don't have venom glands. Some opilionis can make a stinky stink and release a diversity of chemicals that just smell and taste bad. If you've ever picked up a daddy long legs and you're like, hmm, that smells weird, that's what happened. They also have the defense mechanism of dropping one of their legs and the leg will continue wiggling and distract the predator while the now uh, seven-legged daddy long leg scurries away. <laughs> They cannot hurt you. They are adorable. You can pick them up. Nothing will happen. Maybe you'll smell a little funny afterwards. Number three, the mantis eats the male mantis when she is copulating. This rarely happens, almost never happens in nature, sometimes happens in captivity. In about, it's it's only in about 20% of the cases where the female mantis will eat the male mantis. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, she has to be really freaking hungry. So that means like if she's looking to even eat the male, she has not eaten for a while. She has some eggs that she needs to provide protein for. And this thing also just happens to be here. Male mantises can actually smell when the female mantis is hungry. It's not a good idea for him to try and mate with her, one, because he'll be eaten. And two, because he wants to make sure that his sperm is going to a good female that has lots of fats and can supplement and provide for those eggs. If that female mantis is starving, she probably doesn't have a lot of eggs and she probably doesn't have good eggs and you probably don't want to waste your sperm on it. So we really only see this phenomenon happen about 20% of the time, which isn't a whole lot. Number four, it is illegal to capture mantises now that we are on the topic of mantises. And I've also heard this about monarch butterflies. You are allowed to go collect mantises and monarch butterflies. It's a thing. You can do it. 
There, of course, are a couple caveats to this. You aren't allowed to collect endangered species, of which neither the monarch nor the mantises are considered endangered. And you're not allowed to collect in protected areas, and you should always follow the laws of your particular country. Most mantises that you find in the United States are not native. The big one, the giant one, like the four incher one, that is the Chinese mantis. It comes in both beautiful green and beautiful brown. However, it is non-native to the United States. Doesn't matter if you collect it. The other one that's really common is the European mantis. As his name suggests, it also doesn't belong in the United States and has absolutely no protections around it. You can capture those things to your heart's content. Even the native species, which are probably less likely to come in contact with or even notice, there are no special regulations as they aren't endangered and uh, they're, they're basically it. no one really cares about insects. So, Number five, moths and butterflies cannot fly if you've touched their wings. When we look at moths and butterflies, they are in the order Lepidoptera, which in Greek means lepido, which is scales, and terra, which are wings. These are the scaled winged insects. Because you guessed it, they have scales on their wings. Who would have guessed? These scale winged insects, the scales do a lot of different functions. They can make the wing waterproof and hydrophobic, as in the case of these morphos behind me. They can make these really beautiful, shiny, bright colors by reflecting light. They can be infused with pigment to help them with camouflage or warning coloration to let you know that they are toxic, like some of the orange ones in here. And there's even specialized modified scales to release pheromones to be like, hey, lady, I'm over here. Come, come smell me. All of these scales are growing off of the wing membrane. So when you touch the butterfly or the moth, you will get some powder on your fingers and you will see the scales come off. However, the scales do nothing to help the insect fly. If anything, they may make the insect fly a little bit more quietly. If you brush too many scales off, they will lose their coloration or they will lose those specialized scales to release pheromones. You aren't immediately endangering the animal. You are, however, possibly secondarily making its life more inconvenient. It might be harder for it to find mates. It might be harder for it to warn predators. It might be harder for it to camouflage. So you may be doing damage like that, but if you just brush, like lightly touch it, it's nothing's going to happen and it will always be able to fly. You can actually tell how old a butterfly or a moth is based on how many wing scales they've lost and the status of their wings, how beat up they are. Moths and butterflies are actually surprisingly good flyers despite looking like they're a paper clip with two giant pieces of paper flapping around <laughs> attached to them. They can actually fly with three wings, they don't even need all four, and they can fly with up to 30% of their wing surface area damaged, which is pretty impressive. You, my good friend, touching the butterfly is not going to hurt it. However, if you have no reason to touch the butterfly, maybe you can just enjoy it in its life flittering around. And myth number six, finally, is that bumblebees can't fly or that theoretically, by mathematics, bumblebees should not be able to fly. We've known how bumblebees can fly and how other insects can fly for actually a pretty decently am long amount of time. Bumblebees, when they fly, first of all, they got two things going for them. The first thing is that they have a wing coupling mechanism called a hamuli, and it takes the first wing and the hind wing and joins them together basically with little Velcro. It's like these little hooks that line the wing and like grab it. So that way when they flap, they're flying with this bigger surface area. So that's number one. Number two, instead of just flapping like this, I'm now a bumblebee, they do this like rotating motion with their wings. And this rotating motion allows them to create specialized vortices that off of their wing that propel them forward. Even when they are bringing their wing back up, those vortices still help push the bumblebee forward. What's really interesting is that some scientists decided to do a study and say like, hey, this is how they fly in like normal atmosphere conditions. What if instead of nitrogen, 
in the atmosphere, right? Because we have oxygen and nitrogen are like the two big ones that we have in the atmosphere. What if we didn't have nitrogen, which is pretty dense, and instead put in helium, which is not at all dense. So these scientists made a chamber that has still the same 21% oxygen that you would find in the atmosphere, but replaced the nitrogen with helium and threw the bumblebees in and see how they did. It turns out they didn't actually flap that much faster. Normal speed for a bumblebee to flap its wings is about 200 hertz or almost 200 times per second. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, hummingbirds! <laughs> and they found that instead of just flapping harder, the bees actually just got more distance with the distance their wings were moving. So they just had more movement instead of moving faster. And this is really interesting because their aerodynamic formula they found is actually just the square of the force and the distance together. So like force is like how fast you're flapping and distance is how far your wings are actually moving. And so instead of compensating on the moving on the flapping faster, they seem to compensate on the actual distance and still flew in these little chambers of mainly helium. So there's a cool experiment for you. Anyway, so we've known how bumblebees can fly for a very long time. If you're interested in learning more about insect flight, my dad, who is an aeronautical engineer, did a video with me in my learning group, the SciHive, on Facebook, and you can watch our three-part series about how all these different insects fly. If you're interested, the link is in the reference section below. Well, my intellectually curious love bugs, I hope that you liked today's video. If you believed any of these myths, let me know down in the comments. If you have any of your own myths, also let me know in the comments. <laughs> I'm thinking about doing a part two of these while I'm still buried in scientific literature. Until then, you can click up here for some commentary react videos. You can click down here for some like me explaining how bugs and stuff work. Uh, and you can click here to subscribe in case you haven't yet. I will see you all very soon. Bye!